today caps the end of our message series called The Big Picture. We've been looking at the overarching story of the Bible in nine different eras, and today we come to the era that's still to come. So we found ourselves last week in what is called the church era or the church age, and this is, this is today. But what we're going to have in Scripture is we're going to have the rest of the story that shows us the era that is to come and is unfolding, and uh, it's going to be quite a finish. As we began this series, the purpose of this series was not just to share the big picture, the story of God's redemption, but to equip you in how you can succinctly tell someone else what God's story is all about. That has been the whole aim behind this series. Yes, I want you to understand the context of Scripture, and when you find yourself in a part of the Bible, you can go, oh, yes, that's this era that's been, uh, been taught and walked through, and we're going to walk through it, but that you have the ability to say, this is the story of God. And this led me to kind of just kind of explore short, succinct stories. And I came across this kind of small movement in the literary world of the shortest stories, and they are six-word stories. So I wanted to share one of these, some of these with you, and then I attempted my own. So here we go. So here's the first story, Epitaph, He Shouldn't Have Fed It. Uh, some of you are like kind of giggling, others of you are like, mm, I don't get it. Whatever he fed was the last thing he ever did. Do you guys see that? That's on his epitaph. An epitaph is what's on a tombstone. He shouldn't have fed it. Okay. How about this one? We kissed. She melted. Mop, please. How about this one? It's behind you. Hurry before it. This next story might be the story of every husband everywhere. You ready? Thought I was right. (laughs) Guys, let's finish it together. I wasn't. That is a story, beginning and end. Thought I was right. I wasn't. Uh, How about this one? This one takes a little bit of thought. He read his obituary with confusion. And then, here's my attempt. The kick is up! Lost power. <laughs> Can't you feel the tension? I could just leave, like, what? Did it, did it, did it, uh, what? Uh, six words, who knew that six words could create a story or bring to your, bring to your mind a situation? Do you feel that you can share the story of God succinctly, crisply, in a way that someone who has no idea about the story of God at all, that they could, they could know from your words what God's plan is revealed in Scripture? That is going to be our aim as we close out this series. This era is called the king's arrival. No, the king's return. Sorry, that was last week. (laughs) Know your material, Hankel. All right. This era we're calling the king's return. And so here are some of the features of the king's return. So we believe that the church age or the church era is going to be completed with an amazing, miraculous event. And this is going to be the appearing of Jesus Christ in the sky. And that those who are dead in Christ and those who are alive in Christ will be caught up in the air with the Lord. It's called in the church world, the rapture. And this will usher in this new era of the king's return. The king will appear. And then for a set of years, uh, we believe a set of seven years, there will be hardship on the earth. And at this time, this will be a massive return to faith by the people of Israel. During this tribulation time, 
The gospel message will, will go and turn the hearts of people towards Christ, and then yet there will still be those, despite all of the calamities and chaos of this time, they will still rebel against God, and then Jesus will return, and He will set foot on the earth, and He will reign for a thousand years. So there will be a rapture, and then there will be a reign. This reign of Christ was inaugurated by the passage that, that Trey read. And I think there's no better person to read about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords than Trey Postel. He's big, he's imposing, he's got, he's got this great voice. I can't even copy it. He did an amazing job. But Jesus is coming back and he's going to reign on earth for a thousand years. And it'll be a time of great blessing, but there will still be sin in the hearts of men. And what we'll find is that just in all previous eras, when God revealed Himself to His people, some turned their hearts to Him in faith, and others rejected Him. And that is going to occur during this reign. <laughs> Mankind will even be given a leg up, because during this thousand years, Satan himself will be restrained. But yet, it will reveal what is hidden in the hearts of men and, and corruption. At the end of the thousand years will come this word, recompense. How many of you used the word recompense in this previous week? So I was, I was trying to think of a word. Now, this word is actually used in, in the scriptures about what Christ is going to bring. It's his recompense. This is the outcome of judgment that is for those who believe in Him and those who don't believe in Him. And there will be reward for those who believe, and there will be eternal punishment for those who do not. And His recompense is coming with Him. So we've had the rapture, His reign, there will be a recompense, and then on the other side of judgment will be renewal. And this is where we're going to spend the majority of our time in the central text that we have today. And this is about the renewal. This is the end of the, the story of redemption. This is the goal. This is what God had in mind from the beginning. And where all of history and all of our lives are being pointed toward this reality. And it is the renewal that God had promised and that He will fulfill. And so what is the significance of this era? This is, this is a question we've been asking throughout this series of what is the significance of each of these nine eras. And here it is. God dwells and reigns with His redeemed people. And all things are made new. This is the significance of this era. That God dwells and reigns with, it's not everyone, is it? It's His redeemed people, and all things are made new. The story of God is a story of redemption. This big picture unfolds. God made us, we sinned, Jesus redeemed. So I want to take you into a beautiful passage. It is a passage that uh, I hope... Um, well, at least for today, if not tomorrow, if not for the rest of your lives, reshapes how you evaluate the things of this earth. Would you turn with me to Revelation chapter 21? Revelation chapter 21, we're going to be in verses 1 through 8 this morning. Revelation 21, 1 to 8, and we're going to look at this in two sections by, by asking two questions. Have you guys heard of the word apocalypse? Have you heard of that word? When you think of apocalypse, what comes to mind? Is it something that, that you would see like out at Burroughs Park on an idyllic day? The ducks are swimming gently across Burroughs Pond. Is that what comes to your mind when you think apocalypse? No! It's chaos! It's upheaval. It's all of these things. It's the apocalypse. It's what happened when, when, we, when Snowvid happened to, to the state of Texas, right? 
an ice storm that shut down the entire state, people thought, this is the end. This is it. Texans everywhere thought, get ready. Jesus is coming. We were in the snow apocalypse. The word apocalypse means to reveal. That's why this book is called Revelation. Apocalypse is, the, is a revelation. It's just that the revelation that we have is strange, mysterious, incredible, horrific, and undeniably beautiful. It is the revelation of God's mystery that still remains, and we will find out Regardless, however we hold our view of the end times, we will find out the truth and the shout of Scripture that Christ, our King, will return. And with Him will come recompense, and He will make all things new. So this revelation was given to one of Christ's apostles, and his name was John. We have John's gospel. He also wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and then he also penned Revelation. And so we can understand this text by answering two questions. What did John see and what did John hear? He's been given a series of visions from the Lord about what the end will be. And here we come to this final vision and we will ask and answer, what did John see and what did John hear? Let's look at the first two verses that will answer the question, what did John see? Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Now, I want you to see here that what John is seeing is he's seeing the end of the story. It says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. So it wasn't a comparison that he was making of, oh, this looks better than this. The old is, it's gone. And do you notice in this verse where it says, the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more? Isn't that kind of an, an interesting comment? You would just kind of assume that the oceans would be part and, part and parcel of the earth. And so I think that there's more being communicated here about what has passed away. The sea is often an image referring to chaos. It's out of the sea that... Uh, one of the beasts of Revelation comes from. So, when we began the story of God, it started with speaking, God speaking into chaos and bringing order and beauty. But in our corruption and in our rebellion, we disrupted the created order of things. Not only was the human heart corrupted, but all of creation was corrupt. And we have been in chaos ever since. John, what he sees is he sees a new heaven and a new earth, and the chaos is gone. This is a hint that everything that has been made wrong or become wrong will be made right. But in what way will that first heaven and the first earth pass away? Well, Second Peter is very helpful for us. In chapter 3, verses 4 through 7, it says, They will say, where is the promise of His coming? Peter is writing to false teachers who are denying that there will be this judgment of God. They, the false teachers, will say, where is the promise of His coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked this fact, that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for what? Fire being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. So what John captures in just a few words of what he sees, he sees a new heaven and a new earth, and the old heaven and the old earth has passed away. Well, all of that contains the fiery judgment of God to destroy everything of the first creation, 
even heaven itself. So he sees this new heaven and this new earth that is unstained by chaos. Verse 2 tells us the second part of what did John see. And he saw the holy city. Verse 2, and I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. In this vision, what is it that John is seeing? (laughs) Well, pastor, he's seeing a city coming out of the sky. (laughs) Well done. What John is seeing is he's seeing the arrival of God's dwelling place. And is his dwelling place in heaven? No. God is making his dwelling in this glorious, beautiful city on his new earth. The story of God's redemption is not whisking us away to clouds and harps to walk through those pearly gates. But that God, from the beginning of time and before, had a design that He could dwell in the presence of the people that He had made, that He could share His reign, that He could receive their worship and their glory. And He began it all By creating a context where he could come and dwell with his people. He did it in the beginning. And we rebelled against him. I want you to to pick up on the fact that this story began in a garden. And here it ends in a city. God's city. If you want to know more about this city and and the the fantastic nature of it, then read beyond our text for the day. And that starts in verse 9 into chapter 22. You can do it during the sermon. It's okay. Uh, I did that growing up all the time. Um, It uses imagery that the city came like a bride. That experience for me uh, is, was indescribable. I turned around and there she was. And God presents his dwelling to his redeemed people in such a way that they would be caught in awe and wonder. They would never have imagined they could take in such a beautiful sight. And the only way that John could describe it is a bride on her wedding day. So what he's seeing, though, the point of what he's seeing is the dwelling of God with man. This is one major aspect of God's story of redemption that God himself would dwell with his people. So this is what he saw. So what did he hear? Well, verse 3, he tells us, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. The key word in this about what John is hearing is he's hearing the declaration that God will dwell with humanity again. Is this word or idea of dwell and dwelling? Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. Has God dwelt with His people before in this, in this big picture series? Has He done this before? Has He lived with His people? He has. He dwelled with them in a garden 
until their corruption prevented that relationship in the presence of God. God then chose to dwell in holy spaces. An ark was created, and in that, and this ark was dedicated and consecrated to the Lord as holy, and it was the presence of God being transported by His people as they wandered through the wilderness and then established the first temple. And the presence of God was there. And when, when Solomon finally constructed the temple, there was this supernatural experience where the presence of God came in the midst of His people. But as had been the case in the previous times, God's Spirit departed because of the corruption of His people. He was not able to stay home with His people. But here, John hears this voice saying, God has made finally and completely His dwelling place. He will dwell with them. They will be His people. And God Himself will be with them as their God. Do you long for this, church? Does this burn in your heart that you will one day be with the Lord? It's interesting what can happen to you when you you make this a focus of study. There were several occasions over the course of the week that I I was just thankful that broken systems, broken people, My own brokenness will be made whole. There'll be no DMV. There should be a rousing amen. You guys know about broken systems, am I right? Do you long to be with your God? Do you think about it? Do you think about Him? Do you think about the fact that there are those that you know and love who are already in His presence? They're singing His praise. Perhaps being given special assignments we can't see or know about. He will make His dwelling with humanity again. So John hears something else. Verse 5. It says, And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. It's interesting that in verse 3, John hears a voice, but we're not expressly told who is speaking. It's a voice from the throne. Verse 5, it says, He who was seated on the throne, behold, and the, and the tense changes. Now you have the voice of the one who is on the throne, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he says, I am making all things new. All things, that's, that's more than just a new home for God's people, but a new earth, a new heaven, new trees, our dogs, you know, maybe they'll be in heaven. Probably, I don't know, that's weird. No more earthquakes that devastate the lives of people in Turkey and Syria. No more refugee camps. No more trash heaps that are the size of mountains. No more fires that claim people's lives. No more betrayal 
in your homes? This is what awaits. Who doesn't want to be a part of that? Who doesn't look around at the condition of the world and go, check please? And God will make everything new. He says, write it down. It's trustworthy and true. Verse 6, he proclaims words that are very similar to the words that Jesus proclaimed on the cross. It's done. It is finished. It's complete. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. This is, these are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. It's a way of saying, before there ever was, and to the end of all things, I am. This is my story. This is my mission, my purpose. I am, Jesus says. I'm the beginning and the end. He says, to the thirsty, I will give him Give from the spring of the water of life without payment. John wrote about an occasion in John chapter 4 where Jesus meets a Samaritan woman at a well. And he offers her a special kind of water. He says, I give you living water. And here this image is recalled that there is an endless supply of living water for those who have believed in Jesus Christ. If you are in Christ, you are the thirsty. You are the one who longs to be with the Lord, longs to be in His presence. And He has life forever without payment. This is the gospel message right here. That there is eternal life made available to all who believe in Jesus Christ. If you believe He's the Son of God who died on the cross for your sin and your rebellion against God. And that he rose from the dead. He made the payment for our sin. It was a payment that we could never pay for ourselves. It's a payment we would never pay for ourselves. Yet God entered into our likeness, took on the form of a servant, and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. But God exalted him to the highest place because Jesus was sinless. He was perfect. He was the only payment that could be made for humanity's sin. He gave up his life. He rose from the dead. And that's why faith in him is what secures your eternal future. Verse 7 says, The one who conquers will have this heritage. And I will be his God, and he will be my son. If you would, if you have your Bible, you can circle or underline conquers. The one who conquers. You may have a version of the Bible that says the one who overcomes. If you're familiar with the book of Revelation, this should should remind you of the seven letters to the churches. Because you have the words of Jesus to seven representative churches. And each letter closes to the one who who conquers to the one who overcomes, who has ears to hear, and he gives a blessing for those who conquer. How do you know if this is you? How can you be confident to know that you are in this group of conquerors? That you can be listed among the names who overcome? Well, John, who wrote this letter, wrote 1 John, and listen to what he wrote In chapter 5, verses 4 through 5, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is a rhetorical question that implies the outcome. Who is it that overcomes except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Answer, Those who overcome can only be those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. So the question remains, for those of you who are in this room, 
who are also hearing this message, do you believe the only way for salvation for your soul forever is belief in Jesus Christ? In God's story of redemption, Jesus is the defining point, person. He came for us, gave his life for us, rose from the dead to break the power of sin and shame, to forgive us our sin if we believe in him and secure a future forever. If you believe, you're one who has overcome. You have overcome because he has overcome. And what Christ has accomplished has been transferred to you. Amazing. So what did John hear? He heard that God will dwell with humanity again, but he also heard that only believers in Christ will dwell with God. Only believers in Christ will dwell with God. So there is a word of hope for those who believe, but this passage closes with a very stern warning. What did John hear? Only believers in Christ will dwell with God. And verse 8 says, But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. I want you to pay attention to the very first word. What word is it in this list? But as for the... There's going to come a point where people will come face to face with the reality, the full totality of who Jesus Christ is. In the passage that Trey read, the context is a, is a context of war and judgment. And it is against the corruption that stands against a holy God. A pastor friend of mine would say, Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And for some they will say, Oh yes, Jesus is Lord. And others will say, Oh no, Jesus is Lord. And they will be afraid. As we've gone through the story of the Bible, there are occasions and moments where people come face to face with angelic beings. And what is often the very first thing that they're told by the angel? Fear not. Don't be afraid. Why? Because they're terrifying. And if an angel is enough that in an angel's presence that any sane person would just fall to their face in fear. Imagine what it will be like to be in the presence of the one who upholds the universe by the word of his power. He is greater than us. He is greater than all things. For those who do not believe, there will be a moment where they come face to face with the one who holds judgment against their rebellion. And they'll be afraid. They're afraid because they have no faith. And because they have no faith and no trust in in what God has revealed, they have lived for themselves. And this list is a summation of of everything that is corrupt in the human heart. This list is not put together for you to go, let's see, okay, I'm not a murderer, I'm good, okay, sexually immoral, no, I'm doing right, okay. marital covenant, okay, sorcerer, I haven't practiced magic lately. Um, this is a, a summation of everything that is corrupt. And there is no portion in eternal life for those who reject Jesus Christ except for eternal judgment. 
You see, the whole story of God's redemption is that God is choosing to dwell and reign with his redeemed people and will make all things new. In order for us to be a part of that story, we must believe that Jesus is who he says he is and that he is our only hope and future. God will dwell and reign with his redeemed people in a renewed creation forever. This is the always true principle from this text. It's exclusive. It demands that you must respond to this claim that the Bible makes. There's either only one way to God or the Bible is false. Either Jesus rose from the dead or he's a charlatan and a fool and a fake and so are we who believe in him. You see, it's not enough to just lump Christianity in with acceptable world religions where people have every right to believe and think the way that they do. That is not the claim of Scripture. The claim of Scripture is there is one author of all reality. And we are living in His story. And He loves us. He loves us so much that He gave us life. He made us in His image and our purpose is to reflect Him and how we steward this reign that He's wanting to share with us. And we turn our hearts away from Him and He came into our condition to rescue us. This is the story of God. So we come now to the big so what. What is the big so what of this entire, not only this passage, but of this entire series? What is the grand so what of the big picture? My friends, it is to do what John is doing. He's telling the story of God's redemption. This is the call for your life and my life. What must we do? Tell the story. If we consider what carries over from the old world to the new world, what is it? If you said nothing, that's incorrect. It's the souls of men and women and children. And it is God's purpose and His story to have mouthpieces who will tell the story that will pull them away from destruction and bring them into the kingdom. The grand so what of the Christian life is to tell the story of God's redemption. Someone told the story to you. There's a friend of mine who's uh, interim uh, preaching uh, up in Washington, and he's such a great communicator. Like, one day I want to grow up to be like my friend Scott. And I just was listening to, uh, to him uh, uh, preach a message, and he talked about sitting on a plane between the Houston area and, and northwest Washington, and he's sitting next to this lady who's in her 80s, and she's, she's telling him her story, and then she starts to tell the gospel to him. When was the last time someone told you the gospel? So he's sitting there in this airplane seat. They're both treasuring the fact that there's the empty seat between them, which is like proof that God exists, right? It's like sacred space. And she's telling her beautiful story of God's redemption in her life. And all she wants to know is, does he know the love of God in Jesus? You see, she's living out what we're all called to do. Tell the story. And here you go, David, it's a big story. There's 
a lot of names I can't pronounce. There's rivers and locations I can't find on a map. What am I, how can I tell this story? Well, maybe this six-word sentence will help. God made, we sinned, Jesus redeemed. God made. He began all reality with the desire in mind that he would dwell with his creation and he would share his reign and receive the worship of his people. We sinned. Rather than yield to this one who made us, we chose to go our own way and we've been going our own way ever since. There's not a generation that has ever turned its own heart to the Lord. So God intervened, and he sent his one and only son to save us. Can you tell the story? God made. We sinned. Jesus redeemed. You want eternal life? Believe and receive what God has done through Jesus. Church, we have to be people who tell the story of God's redemption. Next week, we launch a series that will be the grand example for us as a church to see the kind of church we are to be, to carry this story forward as people who are already sent in the name of Jesus. We're going to start the book of Acts together. And I can't wait to dive into this book and walk through it with you. It's going to challenge us. It's going to correct us. But today, I want you to walk out of here knowing you have a story to tell. And it is God's design in this church age that it would be His people to say, this is my story. This is my song.